Buenos días de nuevo. Good morning again. After the inauguration stage of this um, doctoral seminar on the European project modernization and governance in a broad framework with shared values and goals, included in, in the program of uh, mobility grants uh, in the honor of uh, Don Marcelino Oreja, I have the honor of presenting Marcelino Oreja Aguirre. You have all a brief curriculum. It is uh, brief because when one looks at the uh, professional itinerary, in particularly in the European field, it's really an honor to have him here and sh sharing uh, his time with us. He started very early in the Ministry for Foreign Affairs with the first government of Adolfo Suárez. He was a senator of the Constituent uh, uh, Parliament and Minister of Foreign Affairs until uh, 1980. He was a key uh, person who submitted the opening of uh, negotiations uh, in, to access uh, the um, the, com the communities, and he was the president of the negotiating committee, and he applied for the uh, accession of Europe, uh, of Spain in the Council of Europe, and later on he was the first Spaniard, and we have to be very proud to be chosen with uh, uh, an absolute majority as Secretary General of the Council of Europe, where he, he among other uh, achievements. He started the uh, cultural itineraries of the council, being the St. James um, route, the, the one that was certified in the council. He was chosen uh, as a European member of parliament, and he participated in the uh, drafting of the draft of constitution for Europe in 1993. What those great days uh, of the Constitution, the European Constitution, that we have to relieve uh, very mm, recently. He was uh, commissioner under Jacques Delors. He's a member of the um, Royal Academy of uh, Sciences and also of the Moral and Political Sciences. Uh, he has been secretary of that um, academy. He's president of the Institute of European Studies of the CEU uh, University was mm, given the uh, title of Marquis of uh, Oreja by the king, and uh, he's a member of the Academy of Juste and uh, the uh, laureate of uh, the Charles V Award, and he's a friend of this foundation, <coughs> uh, participating in uh, many of our activities, uh, notwithstanding his uh, busy life. Uh, you have uh, the floor. Mr. Uh, Mayor, Dr. Evert, Director of the Foundation, what I would like is that with this my intervention would finish right now because you're going to be uh, quite uh, disappointed after the beautiful words you have said about me. But uh, my uh, duty is my duty, and I, I wish to talk. And I, one of my typical ideas uh, since I was a young man was to keep learning all the time. And I have uh, read some of your contributions, and I have started taking taking notes uh, of what you are going to present. I'm very happy to be here in Euste, which has a huge meaning for any Spaniard, for any European, and for any citizen. Living is not to see things passing, but coming back. And for me, this is very enriching, particularly now. I have always had uh, an academic vocation I remember when I was in Brussels in the commission, 
and I left uh, on Friday to teach in the university and on Saturday I gave a few lectures in the university in Madrid and for me that was very enriching because it was a moment when we were modifying the text of the treaty and I have heard the ideas from the students that were quite useful for us to advance. The topic that I have chosen is the one that you have the uh, um, modernization and governance of the European project which is worrying me a lot and it is the uh, shared values and goals. So this is going to be the topic that I proposed, modernization and governance in a plural framework with shared values and goals of the European project. We have hi highlighted the importance of these values, considering the moment of uh, uh, concern that we are living in Europe, which is marked by the return of nationalism uh, in several countries. In Spain, we have known what nationalism is about, and I am very worried for this awakening of nationalism in Europe. We know very well that many of the goals of the European Union have been achieved thanks to the strength of its universal values, which are at the base of its immense work. Among the international agreements and declarations, which are the pillars of those values, we have the European Convention of Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms of 1950, which, together with the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights is the basis of the system of protection of rights applied in member states. Since the Maastricht Treaty, the process of constitution of the Union and therefore of protection and promotion of fundamental rights and democratic freedoms has received a special push. Two are probably the highlights in this process that you know very well, have been the inclusion of Articles 6 and 7 in the Treaty of Amsterdam and the drafting of the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the Union uh, approved by the European Council of Biarritz in 2000 with a binding uh, nature since the entry into force of the Lisbon Treaty of 2007. 2007. This treaty incorporates the Charter of Fundamental Rights into primary law, demanding its binding nature. The Charter is one of the main references to measure if uh, in a country of the European Union there is a serious danger of violation of common European values and principles. This is the legal framework that establishes the European standards and it is part of the common heritage of community values. But democratic freedoms and the principles of pluralistic democracy are not only legal mechanisms or technical instruments that guarantee the separation of powers and the preservation of minority rights against the majority, but also the means to establish at the same time, an order of ethic, ethical and legal values, in short, a moral philosophy, in whose center stands the dignity of the person, their inviolability, freedom, and equality. This set of values is the result of a philosophical legal tradition in which diverse milestones of European identity converge. The Greek polis, Stoicism, Roman citizenship, Christianity, Enlightenment, Kantian philosophy. Among these milestones, I would like to emphasize especially the legacy left by the School of Salamanca and Francisco de Vitoria, its highest representative, and uh, the contribution it has made to this philosophical legal tradition, which has not only been recognized. In June last year, at this very place, the Monastery of Eustace, we were invited to participate at a conference of, on Charles V, Victoria and Erasmus, scholars from the European and Ibero-American Academy of Houston, from the University of Salamanca, 
and from the Institute of European Studies of the CEU, San Paolo University, uh, we took part in, in this uh, conference. And one of the topics we discussed in that conference was the doctrinal legacy of the School of Salamanca and Francisco de Vitoria in particular, which is not limited to addressing the classical themes of theology marked by geographical discoveries, the development of technique and science, the expansion of trade, the emergence of the modern state, and the blooming of universities. His work goes further and addresses philosophical, political, and legal issues as diverse as the origin of civil authority, distinguishing competences and roles traditionally disputed between the church and the Christian princes, as well as the right of conquest, colonization of the new world, and its legitimate causes to which Vittoria dedicates one of its most famous ethical legal reflections. The legacy of Vittoria and the School of Salamanca has not always been recognized. And it was not until the end of the 19th century when international law became a science when uh, his contributions were first recognized. And there is a second rebirth which happened in the interwar period when the cornerstone of the international community was sought to legitimize the universalism of the League of Nations. But its final consolidation took place after the years of the Cold War. Francisco de Vitoria and his ideas, which shaped, shaped international law and recognized since then as the origin of modernity, inaugurated at a very specific historical moment, the discovery of America, which opened the horizon towards a new unknown space which brought about the generation of new ideas and categories necessary to face relations with that new world. The victorious doctrine survives after five centuries and his concepts of international law are still valid today, a fact which makes him a classic. Among uh, his aspirations, I wish to uh, highlight uh, one in particular for the role it plays in forging European values. It is attributed to Francisco de Vitoria, a first theological and philosophical foundation of the legal notion of the person's dignity and the legal concept of human rights, as he argued that political power resides in the human community. According to my close friend, Professor Carrillo Salcedo, the School of Salamanca with its theory of power and its conception of the common good established the limits of a state power and founded with it philosophically an incipient notion of human rights. For Francisco de Vitoria, power uh, resides in the, uh, the human community as such. Political power is not absolute, but it is subject to divine law natural law, the law of nations, and the positive law of each political community. This idea is the fruit of the uh, thought of the idea that all men beyond their social and political status participate in an ethical natural order whose basic principles are the unity of the human race, the dignity of the person um, created in the image of God, that is the essential equality of human beings. In this manner, the Inviolability of human dignity gives meaning to all the democratic rights and freedoms, a meaning which transcends its character of mere legal protection against power and reinforce, reinforces it as an objective order that even in a full, fully secularized world and legal space reveals that respect for the survival of something which uh, behind the humanist uh, philosophy of the Enlightenment and its political expression appears in the Declaration of Human Rights. In addition to the European philosophical legal tradition, another foundation on which the values of the European uh, Europe is, are based is historical and political in nature. The European history of the 20th century is a foundation of collective historical experience that reinforces positive application of member states and increases their responsibility. For instance, the uniqueness of crimes of the Holocaust is an exhortation to be permanently watchful against all forms of dictatorship, 
totalitarianism and violation of human rights. We should be aware, looking around us, that today, more than ever, we have to preserve and to put in practice those values because our identity and our deepest convictions depend on that. Today, these values are often questioned and threatened. In this sense, I will begin by talking about the case of Austria in the year 2000, which was a first warning, although lately there are many situations that arise and that require from the community institutions the utmost determination in the defense of European values. On February 9, 2000, the establishment in Austria of a coalition government between the Conservative Party and the Liberal Party meant the participation in the government of the latter, characterized by, by its xenophobic and extremist statements. This brought about a reaction from the member states of the European Union, which led to a critical situation both from a political and legal point of view. Given the attitudes of the Austrian coalition government and in the absence of a sufficient legal basis in Article 7 of the Treaty of Amsterdam, 14 of the member states of the Union opted to impose on that country a series of bilateral diplomatic measures. Simultaneously, they granted the mandate to the head of the government of the country that occupied the rotating presidency of the council, which at that time was the Portuguese prime minister, Antonio Guterres, current secretary general of the UN, to take action on the Austrian government on behalf of the other countries. The measures of diplomatic distancing from the Austrian government included the non-reception of its ambassadors and the refusal to support Austria in its proposals for candidates for international posts. These and other concrete actions intended to show the rejection of the entry into the Austrian government of a party like the FPÖ, uh, the Austrian Freedom Party, which apparently was liberal, but which differed vastly of that. The effect of these actions was to raise awareness in the Austrian public opinion on the importance of respecting and promoting common European values, and in that manner to encourage Austria to make itself clear on the difficulties posed by the immigration and the integration of foreigners, as well as the need to overcome prejudices regarding recognition of the other. The Austrian crisis raised the need of a substantial reform of Article 7 of the treaty so that it could be applied not only in case of human rights violations, but also in a preventive manner when the risk of violation of such rights would be detected, as well as in cases of xenophobic actions. This would allow that in situations similar to the Austrian one, an early warning mechanism be activated because it seemed more coherent than waiting for the acts of transgression to take place. To facilitate the lifting of diplomatic isolation of Austria, member states agreed to refer to the president of the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg who was the Swiss jurist, Lucius Wilhaber, to appoint international experts to prepare a report to be presented to the presidency of the council on the Austrian situation, so that uh, his opinion could prompt a reconsideration of their relations with the Austrian government. The authors of the report were uh, some from the north, from the uh, center and from the south, was the former president of Finland and Nobel Prize, uh, Nobel, Nobel Peace Prize laureate, a former secretary of the Council of Europe, myself, and a German expert of human rights. I can guarantee you that I never learned so much uh, 
uh, with the help also of Carrillo Sacedo, I asked him to accompany me uh, so as to help me in the drafting of that text. And we uh, did it on the basis of two elements. The level of commitment of the Austrian government to common European values, in particular as regards the rights of minorities, refugees and immigrants, and on the other hand, on the basis of the analysis of the evolution of the political nature of the FPÖ, uh, which had veered from community practices. <coughs> the report, which took us a whole uh, summer, because it was an anomalous and uh, new situation, we were crossing communications all the time. We met in different places. Uh, that report, as I say, on the defense of democratic values, we highlighted the limits beyond which the legitimate freedom of speech of certain political leaders could become uh, incitement to xenophobic and ethnic hatred or the criminalization of political opponents. In that sense, uh, it should be recognized that under the strong will of the federal president of Austria, the new Austrian government marked through a formal declaration signed by the two parties of the coalition, a clear dividing line. However, in recent cases, uh, unfortunately, uh, recent cases of, of corruption uh, brought Austria uh, to the fore again. The vice chancellor and leader of the FPO, Heinz Christian Strache, has had to resign due to a video made public in which he offered public bids in exchange for electoral support. And that has led the conservative chancellor, Sebastian Kurz, to break the coalition among the conservatives and the Austrian extreme right and announce the call of elections under the pressure of citizens mobilized by the magnitude of the scandals involving members of the FPÖ in the government. Uh, so we will see uh, that uh, the Austrian case has uh, showed, has shown the, the, the need to reform Article 7 of the treaty with recommendations on the introduction of prevention, early warning, and monitoring procedures. These recommendations were taken into consideration and the subsequent amendment of the treaty changed Article 7 in that regard. By granting the Union the capacity to intervene in a preventive manner in the event of clear risk of serious violation of common values, the Treaty of Nice later managed to make more operative the means already included in the text of the Treaty of Amsterdam, which allowed only post facto intervention when those rights had already uh, been violated. So a prevention system was added to the sanction mechanism of the Treaty of Amsterdam. And from then on, on both mechanisms uh, coexist. And the implementation of the former is not a necessary condition to trigger the latter. After the amendment, Article 7 gives the Commission a new competence to control fundamental rights in the Union, allow, allowing to identify potential risks. This control or supervision competence has recently been put into practice in relation to Poland. 16 years after the events in Austria that I just referred to, it was said that the ghost reappeared in Poland. The adoption in Poland of controversial legislation on its judicial system that blurs the separation of powers opened a dangerous and authoritarian way that enters into flagrant conflict with European values, which prompted the European Commission to initiate a dialogue with the government of that country as of January 2016. On July 29, 2017, the Commission opened an infringement procedure in relation to the law of the ordinary courts of Poland for its provisions on retirement and its impact on the independence of the judiciary and refer the matter to the Court of Justice on December 20, 2017. The Commission also invoked for the first time the procedure provided for in Article 7.1 of the TEU 
by submitting a recent proposal for a council decision on the determination of an unequivocal risk of serious violation of the rule of law in Poland and decided to enable the first vice president of the commission, Franz Timmermans, to initiate the infringement procedure by sending a letter of summons to Poland related to the Supreme Court law of that country. This uh, law lowered the retirement age of the Supreme Court judges from 70 to 65 years, which meant the forced retirement of 27 out of the 72 judges of the Supreme Court before the end of their term. This measure also applied to the first president of the Supreme Court, whose six-year term was prematurely interrupted. These were tricks uh, uh, used by Poland. In addition, the new law expanded the number of magistrates to 120, most of whom could be appointed by the executive. The European Commission was of the opinion that these measure, measures undermined the principle of the independence of the judiciary, including the irremovability, uh, irremovability of judges and magistrates. And consequently, Poland failed to comply with its obligation under Article 19.1 of the Treaty of the European Union concerning Article 47 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the Union. I think it is reassuring to know this historical decision of unpredictable political and institutional consequences adopted on October 19, 2018 by the European Court of Justice which stopped the reform of the Supreme Court in Poland, as well as the response of the Polish government reversing its controversial Supreme Court reform. For the first time, European justice, at the request of the Commission, temporarily blocked in a country of the Union a reform of such depth as it is the design of a Supreme Court. The European Court of, uh, order issued by the Vice President Rosario Silva de la Puerta, Spanish national, ordered Poland to suspend the application of the rule, to keep the judges involved in their posts, and to stop any new appointment. The order argued that the Commission's obligations were well founded. In addition, the Vice President of the Court admitted the urgency invoked by the Commission to request precautionary measures, given that the application of the reform could lead to a transformation of the Polish Supreme Court and result in sentences handed down without sufficient guarantees of independence of justice. The decision of the Luxembourg Tribunal could have further aggravated the conflict between the European institutions and the government of Poland. However, the Polish government avoided the situation and it is encouraging its response by approving the 21st of November 2018 in its parliament, a seventh amendment to the controversial law, which included the reinstatement of the 27 judges who were forcibly retired last July. The amendment was approved quickly thanks to the majority that the party in the executive had in the parliament. Europe's unequivocal message has thus stopped, for the time being at least, uh, Poland's authoritarian uh, drift. However, there are other sources of concern that have recently emerged. We should highlight, for instance, what happened in Romania, where the Social Democrats executive did not pass the test of the Venice Commission, uh, which you know is an advisory body on constitutional matters of the Council of Europe which expressed concern about the changes made in the criminal code and in the law of criminal procedure. Romania is subject, since it joined the European Union in 2007, to the mechanism of cooperation and communication that checks, among other issues, its progress in judicial matters. However, for some time, the reports warned of a setback. Romania was under intense scrutiny by Brussels due to reforms that uh, undermined uh, judicial independence and the fight against corruption, as well as imbalances in its public accounts, which called into question its ability to lead and moderate the major European debates that it had to undertake from January 1st, when for the first time 
Romania assumed the rotating presidency of the Council of the EU. The PSD government received strong criticism from the European Commission for its attempts to soften the anti-corruption laws in a series of legal reforms that benefited members of the ruling party involved in justice cases. It was an agenda of judicial amendments of the PSD, which promoted the reduction of sentences and the statutes of limitations for some corruption offenses through government decrees that did not, did not pass through parliament. The highest court in Romania has condemned on 27th May the leader of the ruling Social Democratic Party uh, to a three year and six months prison sentence for corruption. The decision came a day after more than six million Romanians, about 80% of those who went to the polls, voted in favor of the constitutional reform proposed in referendum to shield the constitutional laws against corruption. So this policy followed by the European institutions is having effects. The referendum was convened by the president of Romania, the conservative Klaus Johannes, with the stated intention to curb corruption. The results of this referendum are encouraging and have been a hard lesson to populism, demagoguery, and the anti-European and anti-justice discourse of the ruling Social Democratic Party uh, threatened with sac sanctions by the European Commission. As Johannes said in his message, uh, European and democratic Romania has won. The Romania where justice is independent and where thieves and criminals are in jail and not at the head of the state. End of quote. Critics of PSD accused Dragnea of promoting changes in justice for his own benefit, since some of the draft amendments meant the prescription of a pending case uh, he had. Another conflictive case is that of Hungary. Since President Orban returned to power in 2010, judicial independence has been undermined. In addition to the independence of other bodies, such as the Data Protection Agency and the National Central Bank, and press freedom has been curtailed, as well as other institutions which criticize the government. For instance, it has been uh, the, the, uh, um, the, there has been an attempt to uh, prosecute the Central European uh, University. Euroscepticism has also been promoted. Consultations to citizens has, have been launched under the title Stop Brussels. Xenophobic actions against immigration have been adopted. European obligations have been breached. Attempts to circumvent the control of the Court of Justice have been uh, ha ha have taken place, and it has been openly promoted democracy, which is not liberal. Um, with serious attack to the rule uh, on the rule of law and separation of powers, which has been the reaction uh, of the European Union. Some consider it limited and insufficient. It has consisted mainly of calls for attention and recommendations from the Commission, the opening of infringement procedures and political statements of condemnation by the European Parliament. But all this has not managed to sufficiently correct the gradual deterioration of the rule of law, which continues to deepen. So we have to ask ourselves, what else can be done? Keeping in mind that the reaction must be firmer and the actions are stronger. Current options um, include, you probably will add others. First, the application of Article 7, Paragraph 1, provides a preventive mechanism for cases of clear risk of serious violation of the rule of law. That mechanism was already initiated by the Commission for Poland, and it has been also activated by the European Parliament for Hungary. In this regard, we welcome the turn of the EPP in the European Parliament that has voted overwhelmingly against the President of Hungary, Orban, not protecting him, though he is part of the same parliamentary group. Faced with serious attacks on European values, we must show firmness and clarity, uh, which means more pressure and rectifications. The problem is that the procedure only provides a political condemnation and new recommendations, but not other types of sanctions. I think it would be desirable to explore what measures could be adopted for cases such as the one we have examined, but it is probably a difficult task. 
In the first place, I suggest that the Article 7, paragraph, paragraph 2, could be applied, which has a corrective nature and implies the finding of a serious and persistent violation of the rule of law. This requires unanimity in the European Council, uh, which is why it is foreseeable that the states involved will support each other and use their veto power to block the approval of this punishment, which could entail important sanctions. In anticipation of potential obstruction, it was suggested to explore a joint action against Hungary and Poland that would leave them out of the vote at the same time and thus prevent them from saving each other. It is a forced interpretation that we don't know if the Court of Justice would support and in addition other states in the Visegrad group could interfere. I recall that is Slovakia Poland, the Czech Republic, and Hungary. Secondly, an infringement procedure could, based on the violation of Article 2 of the treaty could be used. This possibility is not obvious either, and there are several objections to its use. For instance, its general nature or the exclusion of its publication because it considers Article uh, 7 as lex specialis. I'm not sure that these are convincing arguments. Anyway. In order to impose effective sanctions, it should be necessary to verify the infraction, wait for the non-compliance of a, of a judgment, and bring the states involved to the court requesting that the fine is imposed. Third, it would be pos possible to freeze the structural funds for non-compliant states. Uh, they are very sensitive to this. The advantage is that it doesn't need unanimity for its approval. However, it would not be easy to obtain the necessary majority given the possible alliances and mutual support among the countries of the Visegrad group that I mentioned before. If approved, it would be done within the process of adoption of the next multi-annual budget framework, thus delaying the sanction to 2021. Beyond the serious situation of Poland, Romania, and Hungary, we cannot ignore that other countries are also object of my preoccupation. The Italian government, with all the due respect to Italians present here, has been turning a deaf ear to all the calls by the Commission to control its excess debt, which is a terrible uh, sorrow for me because when I was uh, initiating my political life. I had, had a lot of friends uh, in Italy, and they were the great supporters of the European Union. Now we have a reiterated uh, non-compliance by Italy, and the Commission has decided in December to propose the start of an unprecedented sanctioning process against Italy on the basis of its excessive deficit. The decision to subject Italy to strict scrutiny has been postponed until June this year. Finally, in view of the repeated failure of Italy to comply, the European Commission has formalized uh, earlier this month the beginning of negotiations for the opening of a file to Rome to protect its accounts uh, due to its growing debt and to put an end to an escalation that already excess, exceeds 132% of the gross domestic pro product. This debt is perceived as one of the greatest internal risks for the euro. At a time of extreme fragility for the government, the Prime Minister Conte has now assured that he will do everything possible to avoid the sanctions that this case could entail. The European Commission, which faces the last months of its mandate, has been flexible, perhaps too flexible, uh, and lent his helping hand to Italy. My door is open said uh, the Commissioner for Economic and Monetary uh, Affairs, Pierre Moscovici. He said it in Italian. Giuseppe Conte's government decision could reach the discussion of the EU finance minister at the, uh, the beginning of July. And there, the Italian minister will not have it easy, since some regret not having initiated the procedure against the Italian government last December. The Italian government seems to accept the latest conclusions from Brussels and on this occasion has blamed its uncontrolled debt on the previous government. Besides, the elections held in Sweden, Sweden, last September, also showed that more and more populist parties 
are moving from marginality to marking Europe's agenda, as it happened last year in the Netherlands, France, Germany, Austria, and Italy. What terrible dis disappointment for us, the old uh, Europeanist. Uh, we cannot reproach reality from uh, its existence. As Guy Verhofstadt, uh, the leader, leader of the liberals in the European Parliament, he has pointed out we cannot be complacent about the rise of the populist extreme right, referring to the FPO, uh, FPO in Austria and the Italian League. The French National Front has reached 34%. And alternative for Deutschland in Germany can be the main force in areas of the east of the country. In Denmark, it is 20%. Viktor Orban has the majority in Hungary. And Italy, uh, as we have said, is in the government, uh, uh, that, that force. It is the return of populism to a prominent position with, uh, we cannot ignore that uh, thinking uh, of a racist, xenophobic, and anti-European strategy. Big parties have been weakened, if not marginalized. In 2015, the EU tried a united response to the migration crisis. And three years later, there is a retreat seeking in vain ways to calm citizens whose fear leads them to increasingly in extreme positions. I think the government of Spain is uh, adopting a correct uh, position. And although I'm not a socialist, I think uh, he's acting uh, properly. There is a very clear gap today between supporters of the European Union and those who want to destroy it. In short, we are going through a widespread uh, presence of extremist parties in Europe. All of them have articulated speech on the basis of the re rejection, not just of the immigrants, but also of the refugees, people who leave their countries because their lives are in serious danger. Of the 28 countries of Europe, of the European Europe, uh, Union, uh, 10 are experiencing strong increases of right-wing parties, six of them members of the Euro, and some are founding countries, such as Germany and Italy. Few images are better to describe the danger that looms over Europe as the one of December 11 last in Paris and Rome. While President Macron was entrenched in the Elysee to resist another barricade by the yellow vests, the xenophobic minister Salvini was hailed by a mass of people in the Italian capital. As Carlos Malamud describes in the newspaper El País, leaders of the anti-Europe are advancing without restraint, while the leaders of the historic project led by the French leader, fall apart when they are most needed. The situation in the face of the European elections last May seemed very bleak. The signs to curb the national populist drift were very weak. Let us recall that the EU is a union of liberal democracies that share inalienable civil values. The danger was not only in isolated cases like the Swedish Democrats that pollute the politics of their country. What was worrying is that added to formation like the League of Matteo Salvini in Italy, Alternative for Germany, or the Freedom Party in Austria, they distorted the core idea of the European construction. In October last, the Italian Home Affairs Minister, Matteo Salvini, announced in Warsaw after meeting with the leader of the ruling party in Poland, Law and Justice, in addition to the Prime Minister and the Polish Home Affairs Minister, their plan to create, in the face of the European elections in May, a European parliamentary group capable of changing the EU from within. On May 19, leaders of 11 Eurosceptic parties met in Milan under the leadership of Matteo Salvini and Le Pen to launch their challenge to the EU. What terrible disappointment. Although the electoral uh, um, elections um, uh, in all the countries um, gave uh, results that are encouraging, do not uh, curtail xenophobic uh, uh, countries. Uh, the. Um, Popular Party was the most voted with 178 uh, seats, the Socialists and Democrats 153, 
but they have decreased their percentage while the nationalist and Eurosceptic parties have increased their representation, but also the European Green parties. The results confirm the decline of traditional political families in the European Parliament. Popular and Social Democrats have given way to a constellation of heterogeneous forces, among which the progress of the Liberals and the substantial growth of the Green parties should be noteworthy, thanks to the results obtained, obtained by the latter in Germany and France. The extreme right, coordinated by Matteo Salvini, has lagged behind the forecasts in the Union as a whole. The new structure of the European Parliament, more fragmented, points only to the need for a chamber increasingly obliged to negotiate in order to reach majorities. <clears throat> the vote had a participation of 50.2% higher than usual in European elections. I would like to conclude this presentation uh, which has been too long, without, without a pessimistic view of the European Union, I'm not ready to be invaded by Euro pessimism. It is evident that beside the uh, preoccupying elements, there are some positive uh, elements as well. The debate on the present and the future of Europe and on the decision of the European Union and its influence at national level is more ever more present both in Spain and in the rest of the member countries. And this is uh, no doubt positive. The solution to our main problems cannot be based on rejecting to share decisions with our partners, but on a European Union with political initiative and relevance inside and outside its borders. And a necessary condition for this strengthening of the Union is to have a European Parliament reinforced by an increasingly higher participation in elections. The EU should show its citizens that it can protect them better and create more opportunities than the, a retreat to nationalism and to closed economies. In order to achieve this, we need to be strong. And strength can only come from the Union, accepting a process of integration among the states. This will also safeguard common European values. The Commission in recent months has been promoting a policy of community borders, making the controversial control of irregular migration a European uh, responsibility, and this is good. The Union thus takes sides with those who defend a greater European sovereignty in the design of the future Europe. Today, we need more than ever a united Europe, a Europe with a social and protective dimension of those who promote unconditional adherence to the European project. And if we cannot count on the American military collaboration, we must develop European strategic capabilities, as Mrs. Merkel has proposed. Policies such as the combat against climate change, the adaptation of our regulatory framework to the digital societies or the control of EU's external borders are debated and approved basically at EU level. And we have to build open and cohesive societies. In addition to achieving an increasingly higher participation, the new parliament must bring about the establishment of a political majority committed to the defense of the democratic values that are, as we well know, at the origin of European integration. As stated by Jean-Claude Juncker, the president of the Commission, in a recent article published in the newspaper El País, the construction of Europe is an ongoing process based on common values, end of quote. For years, we have been talking about the European Union as a community of values. That is what many of the Spaniards thought in the 70s when we showed our support for a quick accession uh, to the European institutions. Faced with the slogan, Spain is different, many of us wanted that Spain were not different, but rather that it would resemble to other uh, European countries. That which materialized quickly. We Spaniards had the same social and public liberties aspirations as other Europeans. What was missing was to crown that desire with our integration and with our joining the club. In 77, when the first elections were held, I was before the first uh, Council of Ministers, the President Adolfo Suarez, uh, talked to the president of the communists, Santiago Carrillo, and with Felipe González for the socialists. And he asked them whether they were ready to approve the uh, request to uh, join the uh, 
uh, union. And I was honored to, as a member of the government, uh, with support from all political forces, to request the opening of negotiations with the community institutions. We joined in 1986 under Socialist Party, Felipe Gonzalez government. And since then, Spain has been a very active member, open to dialogue, to negotiations, and to compromise, respectful of the rights and freedoms of citizens. And I hope that we remain true to the principles and values that have always inspired the EU. Because only values, and I'm finishing, will save the European synthesis. The values that created Europe are the values that will keep it on solid ground. Europe, rooted in values, will continue to contribute to the human species, its wisdom and its spirituality. Let us go back to the basic principles of the Judeo-Christian and Greco-Roman traditions, which were the sources of inspiration for our European founding parents. Let us propose to European youth models of virtuous people with the habits of courage, justice, prudence, and generosity. Let us strive in favor of a call to unity in our transmission of a culture of values that opposes postmodern uh, post relativism and opportunistic possibilism. Let us dream of a better world, not based only on technical advances and scientific revolutions, but on ethical behaviors of people on the discovery of the true path in pursuit of a common horizon. And let us do it in, along the path of principles, along the long and courageous route of those values that make up the Europe of globalization. I conclude with words that impressed me years ago when I was reading a book, uh, a Return to Europe, by then Cardinal Ratzinger, where he says that the idea of Europe was launched after the end of the Second World War to definitely, definitely uh, reject the nationalist heresy. And he also tells us with clear premonition that the danger of nationalism was not overcome. And I finish with a quote that I have made many times of Pope John Paul II in Santiago de Compostela, to whom I listen with emotion. Europe, find yourself again, be yourself, discover your origin, steer your roots, those authentic values that made your history glorious and your presence beneficial. Do not get depressed by the quantitative loss of your greatness. Your power is to be the beacon of civilization and a stimulus of progress for the world. The other continents look at you and expect from you the same answer that St. James gave to Christ. I can do it. Thank you very much for your attention. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you, Dr. Marcelino, for this lecture. Well, you have talked about the history, not just of the beginnings of the European Union, the foundation of the European Union, also all the concerns and costs and challenges that we have before us. And also, you have even hinted some solutions and steps to take and topics to tackle if we want to consider um, pursuing that pathway initiated by the founders of the European Union. Yesterday, I was saying before we met Fedina that if I was worried to see you worried or to hear that you were worried about European Union, but fortunately, you have made clear that you are still optimistic, and that relieves me because it is true that we are now at a stake in a tough moment with many challenges simultaneously and changing times after the recent, the latest European election. So I've thought of many things while I was listening to you while I was listening to you. But in the end, you've given me answers to all of my questions. You've given us answers to all the challenges that we will be living in this project that is called the European Union. But maybe there are questions among the audience, and I don't want to neglect or dismiss this opportunity that we have in case you had something to share with uh, uh, Mr. 
Oreja, we can take a few questions, a couple of questions before the cafe break. So please stand up, um, introduce yourself and make your question. Good morning. My name is Ruth Ferrero from the Complutense University in Madrid, and I want to make a question related to the implementation of the articles that were used in the case of Poland and Hungary invoked about the intervention of the executive power in the judicial power. Because I, f I think that the Polish institutions are arguing that they are following the Spanish model in the appointment of judges. So I'd like to know what you think about it because I've been talking to the Spanish ambassador in Poland who was really worried about that assumption, that argument used by Poland in defending their view. Well, I don't know what happened, and I don't know who said what, so I cannot give you a proper answer, but I think something that doesn't really fit in to the European values needs to be changed. So, well, I don't know what happened, but if it's not acceptable by, by European standards, cannot be accepted. That is a demand when we, well, a anyway, when you, in the accession of countries to the European Union, it is, of course, assumed that the countries will accept or will abide by the European laws. So it is expected from them to abide by the European laws. In 1986, when we joined Europe, we can say that most Spaniards were agreed with the European laws and all the political parties, all the political parties to the even the Catalan parties, the Basque parties, the regionalist parties, and of course the People's Party and the Socialist Party have always abided by the European laws. Being part of Europe has never been a problem in Spain, so I hope this will be the future too, and I hope it will, and I'm sure it will, because there are no symptoms to the contrary. not in the cabinet or in the shadow cabinet. So I think that will be the policy to follow and the path to follow, the path that will be followed in Europe. In Spain, we're very happy to be part of Europe and there is a very well-rooted feeling of belonging in Europe. In 1962, when the creation of the European communities was being thought of, I was working at the Ministry for Foreign Affairs, I was 26 at that time, and I remember then that the, in Christmas Eve that year, I went to the ministry and someone said, I was listening to the statement by the first minister, the, the prime minister, sorry, in the United Kingdom, and um, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in the United Kingdom, and said, I'm very pessimistic after, after we heard yesterday. And he asked me to start a formal application to be part of the European Union. And I said, well, you know, um, Spanish is, Spain is not a democracy. Well, anyway, you draft an um, application and send it, and send it. So that's how we send it on 16, sorry, 1962. No reply. We sent a second application in 1965, and then we got a reply, and that's how we started all the negotiations with very promising beginnings for Spain. Remember that we were still a dictatorship, and then we used it as a lever for our accession a few years later. And a key person in that whole process, the most important person 
is, of course, the person that is going to give the closing speech in this doctoral seminar, a person that played an important role, a key role in the Spanish politics. Uh, Raimundo Basso, he's 92, but very young in his mind. And for me, he was the most significant person at that time and in Spanish history. So um, I asked for the director of the course in Miguel Angel to bring him here, and he accepted, and he's coming. He's not coming today or tomorrow. He's coming mm -hmm. on Friday because his wife is sick. And I want to defend him here because he knows the story as no one else, Raimundo Basso. So that continuum has been kept. That continuity has been kept in Spain throughout all that time. And another key person was mm -hmm. former President Felipe González. He was really convinced of the importance of being part of Europe. But he wasn't so convinced of the um, of Europe, uh, sorry, Spain uh, entering NATO, as you know. Well, I want to keep it brief. I've brought some copies of a book called Memoria and Esperanza, uh, Memory and Hope in English, that both uh, with uh, other attributes are the essence of everything we do. So it's an allegory. Please think about it and have a look at the copies of the book and think about it. Those have been the uh, beacons of the path that I've covered, that I've worked in my life. I was... Um, Coincidentally, the person that was there with the support of all the political parties and all the political forces, because I think the basic problems in a country need to be solved and tackled by all the political parties. And I can say with pride that both the UCD, my party, and the People's Party, and the Socialists and the Communists were keen on supporting the entry of Spain in the European community. So I think we have to keep our eyes our hopes high. We have a second question over there. That will be the last question. I will keep my answer brief. My name is Mari Cruz Arco from the uh, Seville University, and I was a student to Professor Carrillo. And of course, I am convinced that the European Union has to be a set of values and principles. So I am relieved to listen to you. Every time I listen to you, I agree with you, and you corroborate with I think, but I still I'm still concerned because when I see that in a democratic world, the people is always right, we wonder why we why people still vote for these xenophobic parties, and maybe we're not conveying the message to the society, especially the young people. I'm really worried about that because. Well, the, the people who vote for the first time, the first voters, first time voters, take for granted that there are so many things that democracy exists. So why bother supporting that? It's like they are bothered by they, that exercise of solidarity, and that's why Maybe they vote for excluding parties, for xenophobic parties, instead of inclusive parties. So how to really make this speech get through to the young people? I hope you won't say that we need a catharsis, because otherwise I will cry. But I think we need to make sure that society understands that we need Europe and we need integration. Otherwise, it won't work. Well, I have. You have a wonderful example in Seville, a person who played a key role in this history, Professor Carrillo Salcedo. I know there are some people who are not from Spain and haven't maybe heard about him, but he has wonderful books and very profound convictions. And he was my soulmate. He was my soul friend, my very close friend, and we studied together at The Hague, and we prepared our PhD thesis 
together. He talked about, he wrote about Europe and I wrote about the sea because, well, it was boring, in, but I wanted to do it because I was born by the sea or close to the sea. And, well, I always remember him and his family. It is true that even if we always have the emergence of xenophobic parties from time to time, it is not as worrying as we might think, but it is important to make the citizens feel Europe and express interest for Europe, for Europe and denounce when things and complain when things do not go right. And well, thank you, thank you very much, Mr. Um, Oreja. Thank you for your messages. Thank you for your for your speech. And you said that we need to keep looking for harmony and agreement. And I would like to add that Europe is a fragile project that we, he we have to keep on supporting and defending. And you are a leader in that mission. And you have allies here in this audience. And thank you. And so, well, you know that Marcelino just mentioned the book. He uh, he's very fond of, and he has brought some copies for the students. And well, since we have now the coffee break, we can keep on talking about these topics and others. Thank you.